The Buddha's teachings are all about training the mind, but he never defines what the mind is. This is apparently a deliberate strategy on his part, because as he says, if you define yourself, you limit yourself. If you have a certain idea of what your mind is or what you are, and hold on to that idea, you find that after a while that places limitations on what you can do, what you think you can know. Reading a lot about the tradition of Romanticism in our culture, one of the things I notice again and again is people define what you are as part of one of their beginning propositions, and then it turns out, oops, you run against some limitations of what you can know based on that definition. And that wasn't the Buddha's approach at all. His question was, what can we do to put an end to suffering? How far can that desire go? How far can we act on it? To what extent can the mind do this? And in the course of discovering what he could do, he learned a lot about the mind that he wouldn't have learned otherwise. So try to be careful. Don't let your idea of who you are or what you are get in the way of what you can do. Because the whole point of the practice is, as the Buddha showed in it in his own practice, figure out what you're doing that's causing suffering and how you might change what you're doing. You see this again and again in his life story. He came up against a brick wall. He started with a particular teacher and discovered, whoops, this is only as far as this teaching can go. Is that as far as any teaching can go? Let's try something different. When Rank came to the end of the teachers he had, then he tested first this path of self-torture, discovered that that didn't work. They backed up and said, is there an alternative? And eventually he found the alternative, trial and error. That's the story of the Buddha's life up until his awakening. And then it was trial and success. But the errors taught him something. He had been doing something, and he finally realized what it was he was doing. And asked him, is it possible to do something else, or do things in a different way? As he said, this was the, one of the secrets to his awakening was not resting content with skillful qualities. In other words, he kept asking, is there something more skillful than this? It requires a lot of determination. And this is one of the reasons why a lot of people didn't make it ahead of the Buddha. Because it's all too easy to say, well, this is as far as I can go. And you learn to content yourself with a little bit of peace or a little bit of knowledge. Say, so that's enough, when you could push further. And one of the reasons why we meditate is to strengthen the mind so it is able to push further. And to answer that big question, is it possible to put an end to suffering? Totally. Here again, the Buddha didn't find what suffering is. He gave examples. And they boil things down to five clinging aggregates, but those are things you have to explore. Those are activities that you do, you cling, and the aggregates themselves that you cling to are activities. The question is, can you do things in a different way? So in one way, it's good to leave things undefined in terms of what you are, or what exactly suffering is, as you, as you discover, as you work on the path, your idea of what counts as dukkha, stress, suffering, gets more and more refined as your practice develops. So again, it's good not to define things too clearly ahead of time. The things the Buddha does define are activities, things you can do, approaches you can take, and also approaches you shouldn't take. This is how we learn about the mind. This is how we learn about the problem of suffering and how we learn about true happiness, is by looking at our actions. So as you're sitting here meditating, the question isn't, 
who you are. The question is, what are you doing? And are the results satisfactory? Do you like the results that you're getting from your meditation? If not, ask yourself, what can I be doing differently? And here it's where it's especially useful not to have things too clearly defined ahead of time in terms of what you are. Because you can ask yourself, what, what are things I didn't think I was able to do? Maybe that's one of the things that's getting in the way of actually doing something that could put an end to suffering. This is what the teachings are for, to give you some ideas or possibilities that might not have occurred to you otherwise, or may have occurred to you only after a very, very, very long time. So we read the teachings for the possibilities that they open up, and then we try them out. But we learn through our own actions. When the Buddha was teaching the Kalamas, he said, you don't go by something simply because it's in the text, or also you don't go by things that just because they make sense to you. Because a lot of things that make sense are not true. A lot of things that are in text may not be true. What you do is you figure out what, what are the practical implications of this teaching, and when I put it into practice, what kind of results do I get? Everything gets tested in your actions, in your thoughts, in your words, in your deeds. And you also look at the counsel of the wise, and the people around you feel are the wisest. So you're not just going on your own lights, you're also learning to raise your standards to theirs. But it's all about action. It's all about what you're doing. And you find that when you don't define yourself too clearly, this is a problem with all, all kinds of approaches. Reading recently about secular Buddhism, the idea, well, we're just biological organisms. How could we know anything deathless? Let's just content ourselves with what makes us feel good in the present moment. Again, that starts out with a definition of what you are, and people are unwilling to let go of that definition, even though it places huge limitations on what they can do. Don't try to leave that question of what you are ill-defined. And look more at the kind of actions you're doing, and you'll find out your sense of what you are, at least as a working idea will depend on what you're doing. And so if you're going to be something, be a meditator. Be a meditator who tries to do the meditation well, someone who really does want to put an end to suffering. In other words, focus your sense of what you are on the things that you desire. And as the Buddha says, we really do define ourselves by our desires. If we have a too clear a notion of what we are as an entity beforehand, it gets in the way of our seeing how mercurial our identities are. We can change from one identity to another very quickly, all based around our desires. So you want to see that process. Identity is a result of a process, and it too is a result of an activity. So focus on the actions and look at the identities as a byproduct, because there will come a point, as the Buddha said, where there's no more desire. And when there's no more desire, there's no more way of defining you at all. This is why when they talk about the arahant, they can't say that the arahants after death either exist or don't exist or both or neither, because you can't define what they are. When you can't define what something is, you can't talk about its existence or non-existence. They're totally free of desire, so there's no definition there at all. So the path starts out with an undefined sense of who you are, and it ends beyond definition as well. The things that aren't defined are the actions you can do. Right mindfulness is defined as a type of action. Right concentration is defined as a series of actions. Learn to focus on those, and let the question of who you are or what you are take care of itself.